Good evening and welcome. I'm Terry Sanchez, Program Specialist here at the Newport Beach Public Library. It's my privilege to get to welcome you all here this evening. Um, I want to make sure that I thank the Friends of the Library for their generous sponsorship. It's because of the Friends that we're able to host lectures um, like tonight's. Um, and I want to just take this time to um, gently remind you, if you have not already, please set, set your, si your cell phones to silent. Um, a couple of items before we, um, before I introduce our speaker this evening that I wanted to mention. I had several patrons inquiring about that couldn't be here tonight, but were very interested in the topic. Um, so if you have friends or family or anyone that um, wanted to or you think would be interested, um, tonight's presentation is being video recorded. It will be available in about one to two weeks after tonight um, on the library's website, our YouTube channel, as well as the city's website. So you can access those there um, by searching virtual programming. Um, and then at the conclusion of the lecture, we will have a time for Q&A. Um, we do have index cards in the back. You probably saw them as you walked in. Um, you're welcome to write uh, questions on that. And then after that portion, we will also take questions from the audience as well. Um, so if you, oftentimes you don't come up with your questions until you're listening to the presentation. So you'll have a chance to ask as many questions as you want. Um, so please feel free. We are um, very pleased to present this blockchain lecture to you tonight. Tonight's topic is one that I think many of us are curious about, maybe intimidated by, um, but I think most of us realize that it's not going away anytime soon, so it's a, it's a good chance for you to, to be introduced and start understanding the basics of blockchain, myself included. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, tonight's lecture will help us understand blockchain technology, its history, and why it's relevant to us. Um, and I'm pleased to introduce our presenter. Our presenter this evening, Farhad Mafi, is a leading technology expert. He has had over 30 years experience in semiconductors, embedded systems, and blockchain-based technology. He is the Blockchain Technology Summit Chairman at UCI, addressing the most innovative blockchain technologies, applications, and advances. He is an author, speaker, and part-time professor at Chapman University and is the CEO of the Savant Company based here in Irvine. Um, so we are very excited that he's here tonight to share his expertise and extensive knowledge on the subject on blockchain technology. Please join me in welcoming Farhad Mafi. Uh, thanks everyone for coming here on Tuesday night on such a cold night. Hopefully this is going to be interesting uh, material for everybody. Terry, thanks for all your help and Amy and Ed. Uh, so I have a lot of material here to cover. I don't want to put you to sleep and you know, and I also don't want to make this a boring you know, presentation. Uh, what I really want to do is uh, give you um, some historical information, why blockchain is important, address some of the key things, so even get into some applications of blockchain before at the end getting to nuts and bolts. Because if I get into nuts and bolts at the beginning, you know, it's, we're going to lose interest you know, and so on. But I want I want you to first of all realize why it is important, why it is relevant, and so on. And so uh, I go as fast as I can. I have a lot of material, and uh, feel free to stop me, you know, uh, or just keep the question at the end, and so that pretty much, you know, uh, we can and try to address them as much as possible. Uh, so. Uh, let me go through this. This is what I always tell everybody. The more I learn, the more I realize how dumb I am. You know, so first, right away, I tell you I don't know a lot of things. You know, so uh, just uh, just staying humble, that would be much um, uh, appreciated. Uh, one thing I want to make sure is that hopefully at the end when we leave here, we have more questions and hopefully you're, you have enough interest that you want to, um, you know, study more, watch some YouTube, you know, uh, uh, videos and uh, send some questions and have follow-ups. Uh, I have no holdings in Bitcoin, Ethereum, or any of these digital currencies, you know. Uh, 
Uh, even though I work with a lot of startups, I'm not here to t tell you about which ones are good, which ones are bad, which ones are you know, good for investment opportunities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, so uh, and all the material that they have over here, subjects will change. If I get a little bit smarter tomorrow, I'm probably going to fix some of this material and make it a little bit better, and so on. So uh, please uh, keep that in mind. Um, and <clears throat> Also, um, this is one thing that I, we, we conduct a lot of technology conferences at UCI. I always use this because in usually when you are in the technology forums, uh, people start predicting the future, you know, and telling you that exactly what's going to happen. And I always say, well, uh, always be careful what you say because you might create funny uh, quotes for future conferences and seminars, you know. I give you a few of them over here. For example, Time Magazine, 1966, said, a remote shopping, while uh, entirely feasible, will flop, you know. <laughs> Or Thomas Watson from IBM chairman actually said, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers, you know. Uh, so that's, uh, and also these are some of my favorite ones, you know. Uh, Bill Gates, you know, only 64K of memory is enough, you know. I mean, we cannot run any application on this amount of memory. Or actually, uh, my dear friend Marty Cooper, who actually invented the cell phone, he actually said, well, no, we're going to keep on using the wire phones, you know, the wire systems, and, and so on. And I'm like, OK, every time I see him, I remind him you know, that you know, I, I don't have that anymore. So <clears throat> when we talk about blockchain, uh, Bitcoin, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, uh, I think Bitcoin has done a lot of disfavor to blockchain because as soon as I say Bitcoin, uh, as soon as I say blockchain anywhere, people start relating it to Bitcoin. Uh, so I have to stand actually over here to read my own slide. Uh, so uh, one thing is, uh, one thing I want to make sure everybody understands that you know we are not here to talk about Bitcoin and uh, Bitcoin talks about public blockchain and, and and of course a lot of concept comes from that, but I'm trying to actually stay away from it for sake of this discussion so we understand the value of blockchain, the benefits of it, and so on. And <clears throat> so I always tell people that Bitcoin is not blockchain. Bitcoin is the first application of public blockchain. And so unfortunately, temporarily has given the blockchain some negative you know, uh, feedback. Uh, uh, you know, uh, news and so on, and also with some of the cryptocurrency stuff that is happening, uh, it's, it hasn't been really good. Uh, so, uh, technology and technology cycle, you know, we live in a really world that uh, we, technology constantly obsolete itself, you know. Uh, so, if you look at some of these products over here, you know, uh, I remember when I had these pagers, I used to have a bunch of coins with me, and every time I had a page, I was looking for a phone booth so I can call the person, you know, who would page me, and so it was a really miserable time. And, and then uh, we, we used to have these PDAs, and I thought, God, this is fantastic. I can just basically have a computer that I can take anywhere with me, and so on. And, and of course, uh, this uh, phone booth, and we, many of us have a bunch of these in our garage, we don't know what to do with it, you know. I keep buying things from Amazon, try to convert them, and I never do, never have the time to do it, you know. So that's the beauty of the technology, you know, uh, that, uh, that, you know, we live in, uh, and that it constantly, you know, changes itself. So uh, whenever we have certain technologies that I, we kind of consider them as a foundational technology, and these foundational technologies, they, they, two things affects them. One is the notion of no, novelty, and the, the second one is how the, their complexity and the ecosystem that is needed to bring those two, these technologies into uh, market, into next level, basically. So if you look at any complex technology, uh, it starts as, you know, People start using it at a very small level, and then it takes a very long time to really cre start creating some transformation in the economy, and then finally reshaping the entire economy. And blockchain is one of those technologies that we are uh, pretty much uh, in this phase right now, believe it or not. You know, and so we have a long way to go to reach this point, but then things are happening a lot faster, so we might be getting there quicker. So as an example, <clears throat> Three engineers, you know, in Bell Labs in 1947 designed the first uh, transistor. It was uh, this ugly looking thing here that you see that they were looking at and, and so on. And 
So if you look at today, the same transistor, which we consider as a foundational technology, in an area as big as a, you know, your fingernail, basically, we are able to put over 57 billion, that's not M, that's B, billion transistor in that area, okay? So we have gone a long way as far as, you know, progressing with this uh, technology, with this, uh, what we call foundational technology. Now, this is a... Um, I exam here for everybody. You know, I want you to read you know, from the first row. <laughs> you know. So uh, what I'm trying to show in this uh, uh, image over here is just this whole notion of foundational technology for you to start to connecting the dots on what I'm talking about. In 1876, you know, uh, telephone was invented you know, uh, by Alexander Bell. And in 1929, TV was invented. After, it took a very long time, you know, almost uh, 50 years till 1979 when the combination of TV and phone created the shopping channel, okay? Uh, so, uh, if you look at this, uh, basically, uh, from 1876 to 1940, you're talking about almost, uh, you know, 60, 70 years, and then so many years after that, you know, till this came to, you know, uh, being stopped having the shopping channel. If you look at the transistor that was inv invented in 1947, Intel, the company, almost 20 years later started it, you know, and then uh, in... Uh, 1970, uh, where was it? Here. 1976, almost 10 years later, they had their own uh, second generation of microprocessor, 8086, which combination of this processor, Microsoft, combination of these products created IBM PC in 1981. And you know, uh, I actually remember I was, you know, I had a small AM phone uh, in my car. I was listening, you know, to the news and they, they said, well, IBM today announced 10, you know, personal computers, you know, and, and so on. So if, if you look at this technology transistor that was pretty much, you know, 20 years later was used by Intel, shrunk to a much smaller area and then a processor that 10 years later came out of that, along with the technology software from Microsoft, all of this were used in order to create IBM PC. So if it wasn't because of the transistors, we wouldn't have any of that, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so we look at some of these technologies, even though at the beginning when those engineers were designing it, they had no idea what they're, not that they had no idea what they're doing, they had no idea where this thing is gonna go, you know, and what's going to happen. So blockchain is the same way, you know. Uh, many people, right away, when you read a lot of magazines, articles, and so on, uh, they say, well, it consumes a lot of power, it has this issue, and so on, they start negating it, as because they're looking at it, and they're looking at the wrong application, and which has a lot of issues associated with it, and then uh, they're trying to judge that technology. Everything else, of course, this is just a sample of things that has happened in the last uh, you know, 150 years. Everything else that you see here is pretty much combination of many, many things. In 1991, in this World Wide Web that was uh, pretty much uh, developed, this started at the you know, ARPA project by US government in 1958, you know, and uh, so look how many years it took till we end up having the official worldwide, you know, web, um, you know, uh, in the form that, in the very basic form of the, of, of the web, and look where we are today, and of course, because of blockchain, many of us are talking about, you know, web 3.0, you know, which is going to really revolutionize, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the web itself, you know, and everything else that we see here, it pretty much, um, you can start tying the, um, um, tying them together to see that 30 years after that, you know, after later how that technology changed and uh, created a totally a brand new market, a brand new product, and so on. The iPhone that we all use, or the Google phone, doesn't matter. Uh, if you look at those, those phones, all of it is because of this transistor. Mm -hmm. And all of it is because of what Microsoft did, you know, from bringing operating system to a PC environment. Because prior to that, we used to have these humongous computers that you needed to have a special air conditioning around it and so on. And uh, I remember when I was going to Cal State Fullerton, I said, every time we wrote a program, we used to have these card decks that, you know, if you drop them, God help you, you know, trying to put them back together and so on. You know, so it's, uh, those are, and see where we are today that they, 
the amount of computing power that we have on our cell phone today is far more than the computing power that actually took uh, you know, man to the moon. Uh, so, I look at the blockchain as a uh, you know, foundational, revolutionary, and transforming uh, and technology. I, couldn't, I wasn't able to find a lot of other new adjectives. So what do I found? I threw it over here. So uh, blockchain should be considered as a foundational technology that will revolutionize the business world, which pretty much involves every aspect of our life. And by uh, completely transforming the notion of ownership, trust, and privacy. Okay, so those three terms, we're going to be hearing about it as we move forward. Just to let you know what is happening on the business side of the blockchain. And pretty much, believe it or not, uh, Samsung has actually been the number one as far as investing into blockchain. And if you look at this list of companies over here, which you won't be able to see probably, is uh, Samsung, you know, Alphabet, which, you know, uh, Google, and PayPal, Microsoft, you name it, Citibank, uh, Wells Fargo. All of these, these are the companies that they have bought in the last uh, several years. So there is a lot of um, you know, M&A is going on, merger and acquisition going on. You know, the company, these big guys are buying a lot of startups and investing a lot of money in that area. So uh, why? Because uh, if you look at it, uh, every one of them have a huge you know, uh, blockchain re related uh, product for internal use and also uh, for uh, external use. So blockchain is happening. Gardner is saying that you know it's going to be a 3.1 trillion dollar you know, business by 230, and, and they also have some other uh, numbers. Again, and, you know, uh, the thing about it is, uh, you know, I don't believe all those numbers, but you know, the, the, some of them are um, very interesting. This is a very interesting one. They actually interview 600 executives, and 84 percent of them said that they're involved at blockchain at some level. Now, some of them, maybe they just bought a book from Amazon, but they're involved. <laughs> in, <laughs> but so they have some level of involvement. You know. okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about privacy. Uh, number one question, is privacy dead? You know, uh, that's, that, that's the big uh, dilemma here you know, that um, everybody uh, talks about it. You know? And some people are saying it's a generational issue, you know, meaning uh, somebody like me you know, uh, who um, I'm constantly worried about where I'm signing up and what I'm doing and so on. Where you know some of my students at Chapman, for them is like, oh, just put your information. It's a pretty secure place. You know, I'm like, really? Do you know that? But they, you know, uh, the way we look at uh, privacy, it really uh, is different for different ages and so on. Uh, if you look at your smartphone, it actually knows you better than you know yourself, you know. And as we also always say, in artificial intelligence knows us better than we know ourselves, you know. Uh, so if you look at some of these devices, and the list is much longer, and I'm sure some of you have some of these products at home or, and, or in your car, etc., they all collecting data. They all collecting data about us. They know they know everything about us, and. And of course, we we all pretty comfortable with it for some reason, and uh, uh, it's uh, I have my Citibank, you know, uh, Mastercard for the last 33 years or so. It knows every single thing about my life, you know. Uh, I. Uh, every uh, March, I go to Nuremberg for a you know embedded board conference event. I'm chairing a session there. So before going there, they start sending me emails. You know, you haven't done your hotel, you haven't done this, and so on. And I'm like, oh my God, they they you know it's like almost uh, admin. You know, they uh, remind you of stuff. Uh, so um, I was talking to a few people here earlier about this whole notion of privacy. So do you trust these guys? I don't care which government, you know, U.S., Europe, whatever, or you trust these people. You know, because apparently we have issue, we don't have issues with these guys. You know, they can collect all of our data, sell it, make money, and so on. We have no problem with that. But as soon as government wants to have our data, we have issues with it. I don't know why is that. It's you know, again, regardless of the generation, this is pretty much across the board. You know, uh, so uh, the information for sale. You know, uh, I. Let me, uh, this t um, privacy statement. How many of you read your privacy statement? Do you know? Oh, very good, impressive. <laughs> I want to talk about 
talk to you after this meal. I want to learn something from you. Where do you find the time and patience? And you know, it's but they're usually written by a lawyer that you know use words that I have never heard of in my life. You know, and they're like 45 pages. You know, and if you don't do this, usually you need uh, you you end up you know dealing with this privacy statement when you absolutely need that app. You know, to put the gas in your car or something. You know, and you have to say okay to everything in order to use it. So they basically get everything. Even if you read it, what are you going to do? Not sign it? Okay, then you don't have that app. You know, that's the best that you can do. You know? So when we look at digital money, you know, I'm not talking about cryptocurrency. I'm talking about uh, central bank digital currency. You know, that, uh, for example, in U.S., um, we are uh, actually a Federal Reserve and you know, branch in Boston is working with MIT for the last, I think, five, six years to design the central bank digital currency for U.S., you know, so bring actual dollar to, to cell phones. You know, and again, I'm not talking about cryptocurrency. I'm, I'm talking about actual U.S. dollar. And so there are a lot of discussions on the notion of privacy. The reason that they haven't really released it technology, um, from the technology side, everything is resolved except this. Why? Because right now, um, you know, if one of you give me five bucks, there is no record of that. You know. But we are not able to duplicate that on the phone. We are not able to duplicate that in any other platform, you know, and so on. So we don't want to lose that. By the way, there are certain countries around the world, don't want to mention the name, you know, that these days, the way they kill you is they disconnect you electronically. Meaning, you know, uh, they won't let you, your credit cards won't work, you know, you're, you're not able to buy a ticket to get on the train, you're not able to uh, basically pay your gas bill, and so on, and so on. Uh, so the, the thing is, and you know, uh, we don't want this. That happens to us. So a lot of a lot of people who are concerned about this notion of privacy, they're saying we we don't want that to happen. So that's why CBDC is being delayed. You know, um, so. Uh, let me introduce this notion of uh, centralized versus decentralized and, and network or peer-to-peer -peer network. By the way, some of these pieces that I'm talking here, uh, we kind of bring them together, you know, so there are reasons behind it. Hopefully, you know, uh, if I don't push you to sleep, you will see the benefits, you know, how they actually tie together. Uh, so when you talk about the peer-to-peer -peer network for everyone's information, uh, in 1999, uh, a college student, uh, Sean Fanning, actually designed this peer-to-peer -peer concept, and he t created a tool called Napster, and he was using it for transferring music free of charge from um, you know, college buddies to, to, to each other, and pretty soon that became a huge issue. So uh, when you look at this peer-to-peer -peer network means any computer that you have, a desktop, laptop, doesn't matter, server, or, and so on, they, once you have this peer-to-peer -peer network, they all can talk to each other, and there is no central you know, uh, um, entity there to really uh, be, be the monitoring anything. So uh, it's much faster for communication purposes, and at the same time, there is no uh, single point of failure. So if we compare the, what we have, Today, as centralized server, which like Facebook, Google, Amazon, and so on, pretty much everything we do today is based on this model. Uh, that means there are, uh, there are server farms that um, the internet is running on top of it, and then we all access the internet to access this content. You know, uh, so when uh, you are using your Facebook. The face, you know, you actually go through this system. You connect, connect to Facebook, and then you go through their Facebook ser uh, servers, and then till the data comes back to you, and so on. So you always have to go through uh, this path. Versus um, in a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, there is no uh, central entity. Uh, all these nodes, by the way, uh, in world of blockchain. Uh, we call these peers or nodes, and you know, or computer, whatever you feel comfortable. But if I if I if I mention nodes here and there, that's what I'm referring to. Any of these are considered nodes. Any smart device can that that can send information, receive information, and communicate. Uh, that is basically considered a, a node. And, and a tablet, etc. So in this case, there is no central entity. Here is everything is centralized. And so that is that that by itself is a huge benefit for the people that they want to get rid of this model. Because they're saying, I don't want these guys to have all of my data. 
you know? And I don't want them to sell my data and I don't want them to misuse it. By the way, uh, do you know how much Facebook makes from an, every one of us as a, as a just a somebody, how much? As a user. Uh, it's about $8 per person, roughly, even if you don't buy anything. And roughly, I think the number was around eight. I don't know what is it exactly these days, but you know something in that range. By just us having an account at Facebook, that's the money. Now, now they have about what three billion users and so on. You multiply that; that just gives you an idea as far as to just by just us being there, how much money they make. Now, what they do with our information, by the way, when you are um, um, and when you sign up with these guys. Your picture, your audio, your video, everything that you load is theirs, you know, and uh, they own it, you know, and so on. So, but by the way, so this is uh, this is this um, uh, this is the model that uh, the people who are pro peer to peer they're trying to basically replace change. Uh, so some of the benefits, of course, when you are peer to peer, is much faster. There is no single point of failure. It's not like if this server goes down you lose all your data because the data is distributed. Another concept, distribution of data. So there is not a central place for data, data is distributed. Whereas here is centrally located in one, one machine or thousands of machines and so on. But there is a single point of failure and, and also a bandwidth issue. This is also much faster for many, many applications. So peer-to-peer uh, -peer is... Uh, based on the notion of decentralization, which uh, we're gonna be hearing it as we read our study uh, blockchain. And the uh, uh, foundational and architecture of blockchain technology is, uh, enables us to use it to faster access across the globe without the needing any uh, middleman or intermediary. Now, imagine if you're doing financial transaction, there is no bank here, there is no intermediary here. You know, and so on. Uh, so that's by itself, you know, it's, it's part of the overall uh, blockchain uh, architecture. Uh, let me see. Uh, let me skip this guy. Okay. Some examples of peer to peer networks, what they're used for, for file sharing. Uh, uh, Skype was using it for the longest time. I, th I have heard that recently they have changed that, but. Uh, they're uh, for direct messaging, and of course, blockchain is based on peer-to-peer -peer architecture, you know, and that's why we're interested in kind of uh, hearing about it. So I'm going to give you, um, by the way, uh, as I said, I'm going to... Um, um, usually people start talking about nuts and bolts of a technology and then they go to applications or make examples or variations of it. And I changed that. I want to actually uh, dive into other areas because it is a lot more interesting. At the same time, you will see the value for it. But uh, before doing that, I want to just give you a sneak preview of the blockchain so at least you know uh, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the fundamental concepts here. Uh, let me just go back. Okay. So blockchain, um, I'm not blocking you, huh? No? OK. Uh, we just uh, reviewed the peer-to-peer -peer network. Each computer also called a node, managed by you know, one or multiple people. Uh, these nodes are capable of storing, uh, sharing files, and assets. You know? And uh, when we run a blockchain protocol, uh, on top of this peer-to-peer -peer network that defines the rules of interface, defines the rules of interface on the network, uh, a strict rule of um, requirement on the data, what, how the data needs to be managed, interaction between the computer nodes and incentives that might exist and so on, that, that, you know, that becomes, that gradually starts you know, forming the um, blockchain. Now, uh, blockchain, uh, peer-to-peer -peer network key characteristics and requirements are, we can summarize it by this four item. Okay, so let's try to understand it. Number one is uh, consensus. So the fact that we are talking to this peer-to-peer, -peer, that means everybody talks to each other, that means they agree on certain things. They agree if a certain data is valid or not. They agree if, uh, you know, uh, of course, I'm not going to go to the details of how they make those agreements, but I just want you to kind of understand, you know, why, you know, uh, this peer-to-peer -peer is useful for that application because they all can share information and, uh, you know, uh, 
come out to some sort of a consensus you know, on certain transaction being valid or not. Uh, second item is uh, provenance. This is a very important thing because uh, basically you have the entire history of the, uh, of the asset. You know, that, where it came from, who touched it, who sold it to who, who is the owner now, and so on. That entire history is part of this whole uh, you know, characteristic of blockchain. So we said blockchain consensus, you know, group decisions and agreement on uh, basically uh, on, you know, if something is valid or not, or something is invalid, uh, if a transaction is va invalid, provenance, uh, the notion of you know, uh, where the asset came from, uh, who, who were the owners, how they changed value, you know, and how many times it exchanged, and who owns it today. You know, that whole information is part of the characteristics of the blockchain. And this is the uh, very, very interesting and unique thing that does not exist in any other technology except in blockchain. And that's the whole notion of you know, immutability. So this one here, it basically means no participants can practically tamper with the transaction after it has been recorded on the ledger. So a ledger, think about it as a database, a list of information. Okay, so what it means? It means once you agree on something and, um, and then it was added to the blockchain, you cannot change it. It's always going to be there. Even if you want to correct it, you have to uh, add the, cor the correct information to the end of the blockchain. So this error is always going to be there, you know, and so on. And so that's the uh, beauty of it. And finality. So a single shared ledger provided, provides one place to go to determine the ownership of, of an asset or completion of a, trans a, a, a transaction. So basically, uh, by having one ledger, one, one database, one a document, that this document is basically uh, shared among these nodes, okay? Uh, we, first of all, don't have a centralized you know, uh, a, a PC anymore or com computer anymore. Uh, this ledger is shared among all of these. They all have a copy of it, and they all agree on the validity of the content of that, um, you know, um, um, basically ledger. And, uh, and then the ledger itself uh, has all the history of every piece of information that is in there, you know. So you, uh, now if you're in the financial world, this is an awesome thing for you. Do you know why? Because you pretty much know exactly what has happened trans for every tra uh, transaction, and that information uh, is always going to be there, um, and so on. And, and nobody can mess with it. Uh, and uh, also, from the historical standpoint, uh, if you know you. Imagine today, for whatever reason, you know, uh, by the way, this is a real life story that I want to share with you. It's not, a, it's not something that I created. Um, one of our friends, uh, she was going to a wedding at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday, you know. So she dresses up, you know, with her husband. They go to the bank because she has her favorite, you know, uh, necklace in the, in the safe deposit box. And she wants to go and basically pick up the necklace. You know, she goes to the bank and, um, well, this is my card and so on. I want to, this is my key. I want to access my safe deposit box. The, well, the bank teller looks at the computer and says, I'm sorry, you don't have a safe deposit box here, you know. And so this is Saturday, like 1 o'clock, 12 o'clock, you know, and so on. And, and she's all ready. They have to be in San Diego by 3 o'clock. And she wants to pick up her favorite necklace. I'm sorry, you know, the, there is no, so you don't have a safe deposit. So can I talk to your manager? Well, yeah, the manager comes and look at the same information. Yeah, I'm sorry, you don't have a safe deposit box over here, and so on. So what do you do? You know, uh, it took them three weeks to bring a lot of documents, call a lot of people, and so on, till they finally corrected that, uh, you know, uh, information on, um, on, the, on the system. So this is the issue with the centralized system. If something goes wrong, if somebody makes the error, either, you know, a bad actor does something wrong or just an innocent error, you know, 
you have you have no way of you know basically you know fighting it unless you have tons of printed records or electronic records that you can actually take it back to the bank and try to uh, fix it and so on. So my point to you here is that uh, when we talk about you know a distributed system that this uh, information they all have the same data basically you know and so. There is no way that you know pretty much one central place can do can have an error and then and you you, don't, you lose your data you lose what you're looking for what what you need and so on so uh, this is uh, that is one of the very important thing about uh, you know uh, blockchain that a lot of uh, companies that are actually interested in this uh, are. Um, looking at to see how they can use it, you know, how they can actually bring it inside the company and how they can also bring it to the group of companies that they're working with and so on. So right away, before I move forward, is everybody okay with this so far? Are we on the right track, you know, and so on? Yes, sir. Yes. I mean, they, each of these combination of they, but they the, talk to each other. So, for instance, in a centralized blockchain, we know who Google is. There is no centralized blockchain right now. Or a centralized data system. system. Yeah. yeah. We know who that company yeah. is, and we know regulations and whatnot. Who, who's behind the? That's the beauty of it. It's uh, it is a paradigm shift. You know, so today we all used to these centralized places and so on, whereas a peer-to-peer -peer wants to really get rid of that, you know. And of course, we're going to have, uh, I'm oversimplifying it here, we can have some level of, you know, uh, basically uh, background on this, you know, and, and, and then there are protocols, software protocols that basically uh, help us to have a securities that we need and so on, but the blockchain itself that runs on top of this, it's responsible for many of those things that you and I are concerned about right now. And that's, uh, that's what we are discussing. Okay. So when we, again, uh, before I move forward, I just want to make sure that, you know, when I talk about the notion of node or peer, this is what I'm talking about, each of these, in the, each of these units here, and this lab, lab computers or iPhones or uh, tablets, et cetera. And when we uh, talk about consensus, prominence, and immutability and f uh, finality, these are the four important characteristics of the blockchain. So these are the reasons that many people are interested in this technology, okay? So what makes blockchain special? This is a quiz, by the way. Did I tell you that we're going to have quiz? Just kidding. <laughs> okay. it's, all right. Uh, so again, uh, uh, blockchain is, um, is for data integrity, trust, ownership, and privacy. And these four characteristics pretty much addresses those topics for us. Okay. So let's look at types of blockchain and why we need them, and so on. Uh, whenever in technology we talk about types, it all depends on application. What is it that we're trying to do? What is our needs? Do you know, what, what system characteristics do we have? What business-related issues we're trying to solve? Uh, technical requirement, participant requirement, uh, business policies and privacy issues that we're trying to resolve. In general, in general, you know, uh, you can look at blockchain as uh, four um, groups of blockchain. We got public blockchain, private or managed blockchain, consortium, you know, uh, consortium uh, uh, blockchain, and also this is also called federated, depending on which book you read and so on, and then uh, hybrid uh, blockchain. And among these categories, there is one uh, common uh, characteristic. It is called uh, permission uh, blockchain and permissionless uh, blockchain. So each of these can have a permission or permissionless uh, blockchain and, you know, on this. So let's uh, look at, the, uh, for example, uh, the whole notion of permission. So the permission one can be a public uh, or a private uh, blockchain. So. Uh, let me, let me just very quickly go to this picture for one second. 
Here, uh, if I want to add one more PC to this thing here, to this group here, well, so that they can, that, that this new individual, he or she can uh, start communicating with the rest of this item, somebody has to give me the permission to add another machine there. Okay, so when we talk about permission, this is we are, we are talking about, you know, adding one more uh, device to this group of devices that they already been talking to each other, you know, and so on. So, uh, and then uh, this particular machine that we just added, for example, uh, if, do we want to allow this uh, individual to just receive information from everybody or we want to allow this individual to also send information to everybody and so on. So where I'm going with this is there are a lot of rules that you can set as depending on our business needs, okay? There is, I don't want you to get fixated on one set of rules and so on. As I said, you know, uh, when we defined our, uh, when we defined um, basically uh, a type of blockchain, uh, it all depends on our business requirement, you know, and so on. For example, if I'm a bank and I have an ATM machine, there are certain functions that I want the customer do on at the ATM machine. And there are certain functions that I don't want the customer do at the ATM machine and so on. You know, so that, those are the rules that the bank sets for us, you know, and so on. Uh, so what we are doing is every time we're talking about you know uh, adding someone uh, adding another node over here there's certain rules that can be applied depending on that particular blockchain and what application for it is and who is uh, controlling it so let's go back to this thing, this thing here uh, so uh, Enterprise, large companies pretty much prefer using a unique uh, form of blockchain called permissioned blockchain, limiting the number of nodes entering the network. So when we talk about in limiting the number of nodes, that means they want to know who is actually coming in and, is, and wants to start talking to them. So far, so good? You know? All right. This is going to be on the quiz, so make sure you take good notes on this. Okay. All right. Uh, and then uh, we have um, public permission blockchain. Um, it can uh, really be accessed by users with permissions. That's, that's uh, uh, really the key. Uh, permission blockchains are a mix between the public and private blockchain, uh, and they support uh, many options, and, you know, many, uh, I mean, they, we offer a lot of customization, you know, based on the applications that we have. Uh, let me skip this one, come to this one. So let's talk about public blockchain. Uh, public blockchain is, everybody has heard about it, the first application of it was Bitcoin, okay? Uh, so uh, pretty much uh, is permission and less, uh, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, is uh, permissionless in nature, allow anyone to join, if I wanna join the Bitcoin network tonight, I can do that. There is no um, rules, and you know I can download it and uh, pretty much um, start um, using it. Public blockchains uh, pretty much allow all the nodes, all these uh, items that you see here, to talk to each other, to interact with each other, and so on, based on the overall blockchain, um, you know, rules and regulations, you know, that uh, blockchain protocol uh, brings. Private blockchain, private blockchain is usually is for one organization. Imagine, imagine, you know, Wells Fargo or, or Microsoft or any of these large enterprises, you know, they can actually have a blockchain inside the company. And uh, so uh, pretty much is for the people inside the company to, to use this blockchain. Now, some of you might say, well, why, you know, uh, a company wants to have a blockchain inside the company and so on. For, for those reasons that you know, uh, we talked about, the fact that all the information that we have on these ledgers, all going to, oh, they're always going to be there forever. We always know the history of every data and so on. So there are certain characteristics of this blockchain that are very useful and companies would like to have that integrated into their system. You know, and that's why you know uh, they, they a lot of them are looking at you know pretty much uh, using a, a a private blockchain. And then uh, let me uh, skip this guy. And then uh, consortium blockchain or federated version. So consortium blockchains are permission blockchain governed by a group of organizations. 
by a group of organizations. Imagine, imagine, uh, you know, uh, you're, um, you're getting a loan, you know, and you're buying a house. So bank might be involved, um, the third parties that are pretty much involved in um, managing all the documentations and so on are involved, the seller uh, information, you know, uh, entities are involved and so on. So each of these can be one of these uh, organizations, basically, you know. So we define who are these people are, and then we pretty much, you know, form a blockchain, uh, you know, that manages those transactions. So the beauty of it is that all those transactions, everybody who is participating in that, uh, you know, model has access to all the data, data that is, is going to be there forever. And, and pretty much, and everybody knows what's going on, you know, at, at every second. So if something new is being added to this ledger, to this list of data, everybody has to approve it. Everybody has to validate that in order for that data to be added to this whole uh, ledger. Everybody is with me on this? Uh, because I, if three or four organizations are working together, you know, uh, on a block, and they have this private blockchain, you know, or we call it fed or federated blockchain. It is a closed loop. It's only among them. So, uh, but still, the rules of blockchain applies. Meaning, if they if they have this ledger, this database that maintains this, this certain data that they all share. If somebody wants to add data or delete data, you know, somebody's going to say, no, 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 I need to check that. So you need, still need to have a consensus in order to uh, add something or, you know, or make changes, et cetera. You know, so that's, that's the beauty of it, you know. So, um, no, you, you can never have, you can always have, but in, our, our goal is to not allow bad actors to go in there and change something or change something in the, or in the history of a, uh, of a transaction and so on. And then a uh, hybrid one, uh, which basically organizations, you know, will expect the best of the world of, you know, hybrid blockchain. These are a combination of private and public uh, blockchain. So private and public blockchain, meaning uh, it is private, but certain aspects of it can have access to outside and be, and be open, you know, for people from outside to be able to join in to do certain functions, you know, and so on. So again, uh, Depending on the application, um, there, believe it or not, you know, there are thousands of applications being developed around these models that I'm describing to you. So don't assume that you know, these are just ideas. No, they're actually products that are being designed and are being shipped based on uh, these concepts. So uh, let me skip through this. Uh, now let's look at some examples of this uh, blockchain app. You know, so we can start kind of connecting the dots to see you know, where uh, some of these real life uh, examples are. Doesn't matter what area, from banking, finance, supply chain, retail, um, you know, uh, government, and so on, they all can benefit from blockchain, and they all have a lot of involvements in blockchain today already. You know? So it doesn't belong to one particular segment. That's why at the beginning I said, I don't want to talk about Bitcoin, and I don't want to distract you, you know, pull you in the wrong direction. I want, to look at you, I want you to look at this as really a foundational technology that can have uh, benefit for all of this. Uh, so let's talk about this. Uh, by the way, if you haven't watched it, I highly recommend you to watch this. You know, uh, and Netflix still has it. It's one of their excellent, you know, documentaries. You know, the social dilemma. You know, it's as an eye opener. You know, it's seriously, and and recommend others, friends, you know, enemies, whoever you know, knows you, you know, to watch it. It's very useful. So if you are not paying for the product, you are the product. So a lot of people say, well, this is just a free app. I'm just using it, having fun, talk to my cousin, and so on. Believe me, you are paying for it. You just don't know about it, you know, uh, and so on. So the, uh, but let's look at it. Imagine if we have a, basically a social media that is based on blockchain. So nothing is centralized. And, and this, uh, you own your own data. 
you can sell your own data, you can actually make money from your own data, and so on, and then you have full control over your privacy, you know, uh, and so on. So that is, uh, that is one of the areas that is actually is being uh, worked on. So uh, supply chain management, this is probably uh, one of the key areas in, um, you know, that is benefiting from blockchain, you know, because every time you talk about supply chain management, it's, everybody knows what supply chain management is? Yes, no, okay. You know, so pretty much it could be factories that are overseas that are putting th things together that they go through a lot of different stages till to get to this country and then get distributed in this country till end customer us go to Walmart or you know, Target and so on and buy it. Uh, so, uh, and then those factories themselves they need to buy products from a lot of other companies and go through the whole, a lot of uh, shipping and receiving and so on and so on in order to really put together those products. So it's a pretty complex you know, uh, process and uh, there's tons of uh, documentation that you know, passes around people every time. I bring these boxes, you know, and I go to, um, you know, Long Beach port, and um, this, um, I get this box, and somebody give me, gives me a piece of paper that you receive 20 boxes, okay? And then that, pa that piece of paper is the only receipt I have. And then I have no other idea as far as where these things actually came from unless I go call them and try to uh, get that information from them and so on. So it's a... Um, the supply chain, uh, the blockchain is, is a technology that actually allows you to really, from the beginning of when a product is being built, you know, or a fish being caught, you know, in the ocean, uh, to know where it actually came from, how many places it went, and so on, all the way till and when it lands on your, you know, plate before you eat it, you know, and so on. So you can you can pretty much know the entire history of that particular fish, you know, of how many hours in various refrigerators it has been, you know, if, and when they sell it to you as fresh, is it really fresh or it was caught four years ago and it's been sitting in somebody's freezer, you know, and so on. So all that information can actually be available to a consumer, you know, and that's the beauty of the blockchain. You, know, you can pretty much read a, a QR code on a, um, you know, on a product and get that entire, you know, uh, information. So, uh, Increase transparency and trust in multi-party transaction, reducing fraud in multi-party transaction, reducing the cost and increasing efficiency, and, um, and a lot more, pretty much, you know. And uh, again, uh, this is actually being implemented big time, and one of the companies that are actually doing a lot of great work in this area is uh, IBM. So uh, Bumblebee, is actually working with SAP uh, to create, a, actually they already done that, to create a blockchain to track fresh fish from ocean to table. So I wasn't just telling you things, it's actually a product. You can actually, you can actually go to their website, look at their press releases, and, you know, and, and see this. Uh, and uh, allows companies such as Bumblebee Food, it's good, good advertising for them, I have to charge them, and to, to a store. Uh, data and create a tamper-proof supply chain history which can um, be shared and sent you know, and by each part. So this whole notion of tamper-proof. So why do we care about this? Why do we care about this tamper-proof here? What part of blockchain controls that? Pardon me? Yes, but what part of the blockchain, you know, those four items I talk, very good, very good, very good. Uh, somebody's listening. No, I'm not just, just, okay. So. What was the answer? I mean, exactly. Uh, so the, the thing about it is, imagine uh, some fisherman, you know, in some country catches the fish and they're supposed to be in certain freezer and so on and, uh, and then they, ship it to someone else, you know, and then they, the papers are going back and forth. Make a long story short, by the time it gets over here, uh, you want to go, uh, you come and say well, to that person, you know, no, I cannot buy this product because it was sitting outside for, you know, 
two days instead of you know, one day maximum and so on. And the guy says, oh, no, 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 it was actually one day. It was an error on my paper. Let me just go fi fix my paper, you know, uh, and so on. So this is an oversimplified example, but in reality, a lot of those documents, you know, they get tampered with, you know, based on people's needs and, you know, and uh, in business. And blockchain pretty much prevents it because from day one, every piece of receipt, you know, that you have, it's going to be part of this database part of this um, you know, ledger, uh, which is pretty much governed by blockchain and you know, rules and regulations, you know, and so on. So this document, every invoice, every piece of shipping information, and so on, everything is in one place. And we are able to pretty much um, know exactly where this product has been from um, beginning to now, you know, and uh, decide if it's something that you know, uh, we want to buy, we want to use, or, um, or not. Uh, let's look at, uh, basically, this is actually, by the way, do you remember this picture? What does it remind you of? Monopoly, <laughs> Monopoly I like that. <laughs> remember, remember we talk about peer-to-peer -peer network? Okay, so imagine uh, pretty much there are computers inside each of these homes. Okay, so they actually have uh, this is actually ha is happening actually in New York. Uh, so there is a utility-based blockchain company, you know, that uh, they are uh, allowing, they have created this system that people can actually sell uh, electricity to each other, you know. And this system um, monitors, you know, who needs it, you know, who has it, who is offering the best price, etc. But whatever you do, it is part of that system. Whatever you do, it is being recorded, so you can not go and change it. If you say this many wattage that I'm selling for the next three days is this much, the cost for it, I cannot change it tomorrow because the market you know, suddenly you know, require, needs it more and say, well, I decided to change my price. No, everything is documented and so on. So these are like real life examples that people are actually using it today. You know? uh, and again, if you just remove each of these homes, uh, it pretty much becomes those laptops and cell phones and so on that we saw in previous pictures, you know, as far as peer-to-peer -peer network uh, uh, talking to each other. So this is a real-life example of uh, blockchain. Web 3.0, uh, this is, uh, I mean, we all, people like, people my age, you know, remember web, before web when we didn't have any web and then when we end up with web, which was pretty basic, boring, and, you know, uh, thing to look at, but we were all very excited because we didn't know any better. We thought this is, this is fantastic, you know, and so on. And then web 2.0 start giving us a lot of transact, a lot of activities. We can actually go sign up for stuff, pay for things, watch movies, and so there are a lot of interactions that are being built, you know, um, around this Web 2.0. And Web 3.0, uh, it's everybody is talking about pretty much using blockchain to build this infrastructure, uh, which basically uh, means, you know, there is no central authority in this case here. There is no uh, Google. Of course, if you ask them, they probably say, well, we are, they're probably involved in developing it and so on. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, VR, AR, you know, and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, interesting technology, artificial intelligence, and so on, you know, uh, that are being built into this thing here, uh, which if each of us, we're going to have our, our, our own um, pretty much avatar running around and experimenting with things and seeing things and, uh, and so on. So again, blockchain is going to be a, play a big role in this area. And there are a lot of startups that are actually developing uh, technology in that area. Uh, shipment of soybean from Argentina to Malaysia, you know. So again, uh, this is, um, the exchange was completed in 24 hours compared to uh, usual 5 to 10 days uh, because of all the paperwork related <laughs> stuff. So uh, the technology that they, the fl blockchain supply chain management uh, technology that they use here, pretty much, um, again, real life example of it. Another one is flowers from Kenya to uh, Netherlands. You know, again, uh, um, pretty much uh, transient uh, time was reduced by 40%, which in the case of the flowers makes a huge difference, you know, as far as the freshness and so on goes, you know. 
so there are a lot of applications, of course, in aerospace, defense, and uh, travel, transportation, um, you name it, uh, which uh, pretty much, um, you know, drives this uh, uh, blockchain. Now, all I want to show you on this one here, even though I have the information, I don't want to bore you with it, uh, there's a concept in, in every technology, you know, we have this. Uh, for blockchain, we have blockchain as a service, you know. Uh, so if you look at this, uh, first of all, market size, they're saying they're around 25 billion by, uh, you know, uh, four years from now. And if you look at this list, you know, pretty much IBM, Microsoft, Amazon, Oracle, and so on, all the uh, major organizations, they already have products based on uh, this, um, you know, uh, um, blockchain as a service. So this is not a futuristic thing. Today you can actually pick up a phone and talk to a, um, you know, IBM, you know, a salesperson and depending on the size of your company, either they say go talk to one of our, you know, a, a, you know agent or, you know, if you're a big guy, you know, then they um, work with you, you know, directly, you know, and so on, you know. So that is, uh, so I'm going to skip through the uh, description of each of those products and don't want to bore you with that. But uh, that's just for you to start appreciating the complexity, you know, of the, um, this um, blockchain and um, the applications of it, where it's going to be used and so on. Let me just go cover a little bit on the blockchain overview. Uh, by the way, everybody associate blockchain with Satisho Nakamoto, you know, and uh, that basically based on the paper that he published in 2008, 2009 regarding Bitcoin. But in reality, it's actually Stuart, you know, Herbert, you know, was the one actually designed it, and he designed it for uh, pretty much uh, managing document, you know, integrity of the digital information. Uh, so uh, it was actually designed, you know, uh, by very well-known scientists in U.S. and uh, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, which nobody knows if he's a person, is a group, is a company, you know, who this individual is, uh, you know, published a paper uh, proposing the blockchain, you know, uh, Bitcoin based on blockchain technology and so on. And everybody looks at uh, his name as, or her name, I don't know, uh, as a uh, pretty much the father of blockchain, which is really a wrong thing, you know, uh, to do. Uh, let me uh, let me skip through this. I want to. Uh, so we talked about this, and you know, so this is a very important thing for us. Let me skip through this. I want to, uh, you know, about the ledger. Let me. Okay. So today, when Mary has a ten thousand dollar, and John has five thousand, and Mary wants to send five thousand to John. A couple of days later, John receives, you know, maybe $10 less, you know, so some delays and some fees. So one of the problems that blockchain is trying to uh, resolve is without having the centralized trust uh, entity, uh, without this body, be able to send that money much faster with um, a minimum fee. So uh, let's go through this very quickly. Uh, I want you to understand the notion of ledger, you know, so at least be able, be able to visualize it. Imagine Mary has 10,000, Alan 75, Rosie, and Henry, and John. So each of these, we call them a node and, or a, and also a participant in this group. Uh, uh, so if I go and document what they have, you know, Mary has 10,000, John 5, Henry 10,000, and so on. And uh, so if I document and even create a record of what they have, this is pretty much a beginning of a ledger, okay? And those circles that you see, I'm saying they're linked together. So each of these pieces of data, they're tied to each other, okay? They're connected. Now, if we we'll start having some transaction. Imagine Mary wants to send a thousand to John, and then John four thousand to Henry, and Alan sends five thousand to Mary, and Alan sends three thousand to Rosie. Here, so we have basically one, two, three, four, five a transaction. We have five transaction, and these are the previous transactions, which only not transaction records that only showed how much each of them have. So after uh, the transaction is actually uh, happened. Uh, now, these are the new dollar amount that each of them have. So this data here, uh, it's basically, uh, it's a, we can call it a, basically a ledger or a database. Now, if I 
combined the four, five pieces of information that I had previously, uh, and then this five new transactions that happen, if I add them all together, and they are all linked together. Uh, so this is what we call an open ledger. So in this case, it is centralized because each of them you know, pretty much uh, don't have access to it, but they all uh, have uh, aware of it, you know, and so on. Now, if we go and uh, pretty much uh, copy that ledger and give a copy of that entire ledger to each of these, now suddenly we have a decentralized or distributed ledger, or peer-to-peer -peer network. You know, so each of these individuals now have a complete, a copy of the complete transaction of what, um, you know, um, what is happening, how much they had at the beginning, and then how much they, what, what sort of a transaction happened, and um, what, uh, you know, how much they have now. Now, in, uh, in blockchain, we have different types of nodes. There's a, some nodes we call them minor nodes. Now, uh, the job of these ones, you can call them, and you know, uh, pretty much more of a, I don't want to call it necessarily police because they do more than that. Their job is to, they validate a transaction and they also uh, validate uh, uh, the transaction, and they also add that validated transaction to the chain. So they do two things, you know. They want to make sure the transaction is valid and then they, they add it to the chain. So let's look at a, an invalid transaction. Transaction. If uh, Henry wants to send 15,000 to Rosie, uh, Henry only has 12,000. So if it wants to do that, it doesn't have the money. So what happens is this is considered as an invalid transaction. So uh, this miners, one of them is going to basically say, no, nope, you cannot do that. So that transaction will not be added to the ledger. Okay. However, uh, if we, Alan wants to send 10,000 to Rosie, Alan has that money, so this is considered as a valid uh, transaction. So in this, uh, in this case, uh, we have a valid uh, transaction. So these two miners, in order for them um, to, what, what's going to happen is, basically these two miners are trying to compete, uh, solve a mathematical problem to see which one is going to be able to solve that problem faster and the winner is going to be the one who are actually going to add the block to the end of the blockchain, okay? And is going to receive some sort of a you know reward for that, okay? So now the two miners will compete uh, for adding the new block to the ledger by solving a complex mathematical problem. The miner that completes the task faster will reward it and would be able to update the ledger. The updated ledger will be distributed to all the nodes on the network. So imagine these two compete and this guy wins and then uh, this guy, um, you know, pretty much, um, you know, after, of course, by winning, I mean solve the problem, solve that mathematical problem very quickly. And now he is going to basically add that new transaction that Alan gave money to Rosie to the end of that uh, you know, uh, ledger, and then a copy of that ledger will be shared with everybody. So everybody knows that basically we added a new ledger, who added it, and where it came from, and so on. So we, we have nodes, each of these. So this is a node, this is also a node. We have full nodes. Full nodes means that uh, uh, basically, uh, the entire blockchain is actually you know, copied over here. Uh, minor nodes are the ones that they come; they have a lot of processing power, uh, so they participate in, um, you know, by in, in that competition in order to do, in order to basically win. And then partial nodes are like cell phones; we cannot, we don't have enough storage to have the entire blockchain, so a subset of that information will be available here. So, by the way, what I'm describing to you here is the Bitcoin. Okay, which is a public blockchain, and um, you know, and basically, uh, financial transaction happen, and then so you keep hearing that because of the Bitcoin, thousands of computers are involved in this mathematical, you know, uh, calculation, and they consume a lot of power, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all of that issues, all of it, it relates to public blockchain and Bitcoin. The, you know, uh, the, um, so the, all the other categories that I describe don't have to have that, you know, so uh, the, the model and the, you know, the, the rules, the, the methodology is significantly different and much, much easier. Uh, so now each node has a copy of that ledger and so on. So let me skip through this. Uh, 
This is one important thing very quickly I want to share with you. There's a concept called hashing. Hashing means you take a bunch of data, doesn't matter, one page, two page, 50 page, doesn't matter. You take that hash, you take that, that amount of data, you put it through what we call a hash function, you get a fixed output length, a fixed output from that entire data. You can call up, you can you can kind of consider it as a fingerprint of that data. Now, if you change one thing in that data, you know, that fingerprint is gonna change. So why do we care about that? Pretty much, uh, you know, in blockchain, we are using a, a hashing technology called SHA2, 256 bits. And what it is, is, let me skip through all of this. Uh, I wanna come to, um, okay. Every block in blockchain has pretty much, I'm oversimplifying it, three important things. Every time you have data here, we have to, it has a hash value, but it also has a hash value of the previous block, and then, of course, its own data. So by always having the hash value of the previous block, we are creating this chain, meaning if I change one block, you know, that hash value is gonna change and I have to go update everything else. And so nobody can do that. So that by itself is gonna make the blockchain, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, uh, solid. And, and the data, you know, uh, kept uh, without the change. Uh, so let me skip this, I wanna, okay. This is what I was referring to. So imagine we have a blockchain with three blocks. The, the hash value of this block is this, and the previous hash value was zero, zero, zero. Every time, the first block always, you know, has the hash value of zero, zero, for, and uses for the previous block. Uh, so this, the hash algorithm for this one uses this plus the content that it has to create this number, okay? The next block, block number two, uses the previous hash of this block uses that number, the previous hash, plus the content over here to create a new hash value. And this model repeats. Over here, this one uh, uses the hash value of this guy, the previous block, plus the content to create this new hash, okay? Now, if we have a bad actor over here, and this bad actor comes from outside, and tries to change the hash value of this one over here. So this hash value uh, was also used over here. So it's gonna change everything over here and everything after that, okay? So that's why they, these are actually chained together, chained together with um, you know, some sort of a signature uh, and so on. So I apologize, I think I'm running out of time. Is that right? Okay. We are kind of running a little close. Sure. And so, I feel like we might be getting into the next level of class, so much information. Exactly, exactly. So what, what I'm sharing with you is that uh, these blocks, you know, there is the technologies that is actually used to connect them, you know, to protect them and so on. And, uh, but uh, the most important thing that, you know, we want to, we, we needed to discuss was really those four items, you know, that pretty much applies to all the other blockchains that, you know, we, uh, we use today in the industry, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, you know, hopefully we can have a blockchain 102, <laughs> you know, this is 101, and we can continue can this. Pardon me? Can you just show the next slide? Next slide is this one, okay. I have about 300 more, so you know, if, you, if you're trying to. <laughs> Thank you so much, for, Farhad. No um, problem. No Emily, problem. if you could just turn the lights on. We, I just want to make sure that we, we do have a handful of questions. You may have developed some questions during his presentation, so I want to make sure that we can get to many as many as we possibly can um, in the few minutes that we have. So we'll start with the questions that people had written down, and then after that, if that's okay with you, Farhad, we'll sure. go ahead and take a few questions. We'll just have you raise your hand um, I feel like the the amount of people is 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 not too crazy so we should be able to hear everyone and, and get to questions so let me just start um, with the first question um, what do you think is the next biggest application using blockchain technology that we should be aware of 
uh, I really don't know. You know, it's, I don't want to speculate, but I believe supply chain management is one big area because it's really international. Everybody's involved with it, so that is probably uh, one area that is we're going to see a lot. But again, if you look at uh, you know healthcare, you know. Uh, the information that you have in between you and your doctor, you know, the pharmacy, the hospital, and so on, that information, who has access to it, you can actually be the owner of that data and you decide which doctor sees what, you know, and so on, rather than, you know, some organization keep all your data and so on. So that is a huge, huge, and then there are a lot of companies that are actually involved in that healthcare, you know, uh, they're driving and that. And education is part of it, you know, finance definitely for obvious reasons, you know, it's, uh, so any place that integrity of the data is important to you, blockchain can play a role. So you tell me which area the integrity of data is not important to you, you know, so that's the, yes. Thank you. Um, next question is, what are your thoughts on the collapse of FTX okay. and Sam Bankman Freed was going to come up. <laughs> yeah. Um, sure. And do you think it forever gave cryptocurrency a bad name? Uh, well, personally, I don't participate in, in cryptocurrency uh, because of one simple reason. You know, uh, when you look at U.S. dollar, when you look at money from every country or say, you know, EU. Uh, there is, or there's a, there's a country behind it. There is infrastructure behind it. There's an economy behind it, and so on. You know, uh, instead of somebody generating an electronic, you know, uh, money that basically is all based on speculations and so on. So I personally don't participate. You know, and uh, so to me, but there's a lot of good activities going on. You know, in the United States, uh, on um, you know, on the uh, central bank digital currency. You know, so if you can care about you know um, having the US dollar in electronic format there's a lot of work is being done in that as soon as they can address the privacy issue you know hopefully in that's but I don't want an FTX you know is all based on speculation you know so I don't participate in that you know and I can't you. recommend it to anyone else you know, <laughs> when I don't do it myself <laughs> um, and then the next question is can you explain NFTs Sure, sure, definitely. Uh, so it's uh, non-fungible uh, tokens, you know. Uh, this is uh, basically, uh, this is a digital representation of assets, you know. Uh, imagine, you know, uh, Mona Lisa, you know. Uh, Louvre Museum can come and say, well, we're going to have the Mona Lisa over here. We can be the custodian of this, but we're going to sell the share of Mona Lisa to, you know, for X amount of dollar to a million people. And you can actually be a part owner of that Mona Lisa, you know, and so on, you know, while even they're keeping it. But there are a lot of artists, there are a lot of people are actually putting their art for sale and, uh, you know, and they're actually making a lot of money in that. Everything that is, uh, you know, uh, I think I have a picture. I want to actually, let me just sh share this with you if I can find it. Uh, now I'm giving all this away for free. <laughs> okay, so if you look at uh, fungible and non-fungible, basically, uh, you know, a US dollar, uh, you know, uh, it's always a US dollar for us, even a Bitcoin or even a barrel of oil. Uh, but a car is different than another car. A home is different than another home. So these are uh, non-fungible, you know, products. You know, you can think about it that way. You know, so pretty much you can trade this because they have their own uniquenesses. You know, when I sell um, the assets of my home, you know, uh, and so on, it's, it's only one home with that particular characteristics. You know, and so on. You know, so uh, when you sell your car, it's only that particular car. It has, it has a, uh, you know basically a serial number, a lot of other numbers that, you know, uh, they're registered so it's not duplicated, you know, and so on. Whereas, you know, in this case, these are the same dollar, they just have different serial numbers, they're, they look identical, and nobody checks the serial number anyway, and so on. And, you know, so uh, these are, this is a huge area, this is a big area for, uh, for you know, for uh, basically um, as we move forward, because more and more people are going to uh, pretty much try to participate in that and you know either have a fraction of something or have their own asset digitized and be able to actually sell it and maintain it and so on yeah 
Thank you. Great on it. That was the it for the written questions. Does anyone have? And I'll let you um, call on so that you know who you're. Sure. Go ahead, start with the lady. And if you could repeat the question so sure. that we can all hear it. Um, you spoke about everything under the sun. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, it's the program that the sun is fascinating. What I am missing, which is, I think, part of it, is digital photography. You did not say one word about it. You're absolutely correct. And on the list that they showed, there are thousands of thousands of products and technologies that they missed. But I was just trying to make a point of saying how some of these things, you know, that was that they that we that were invented 40 years later, they created a totally brand new application and so on. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. I can't argue with that. Sir? Yeah, I wanted to find out. I came by because um, of, I thought blockchain is crypto Bitcoin. Sure. So how can you summarize in a few words what's a blockchain? Is it a block? One block or a chain that's like a different <coughs> event, or Just a few words to... Uh, basically, look at it as a digital ledger you know, that is distributed among nodes. And those nodes are all governed by blockchain, and, you know, uh, rules and regulations, and you know, and protocol. Basically, I'm oversimplifying it. You know, yeah, yeah. It's uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, all the records that you have. If if you're doing involved in financial you know, activities, all the records that you have, pretty much all of that is protected and distributed among all the participants. You know. And that's that's a blockchain. You can oversimplify it. Yes, sir. Let's say if I want to begin to develop something in blockchain, what is my what is my first step? Do I need to masterize a, a web development language or, or SEL or? It depends on what you want to do. For example, if you want to be a developer uh, as a, and you know work for a company that is involved with blockchain, there are certain languages that you have to learn, and you know those languages. If you uh, if you want to actually have ideas that you want to implement, then you're going to hire some of those programmers to help you to develop that uh, and that. So it all depends on what is it that you want to do. But there are a lot of uh, blockchain organizations, you know that. Uh, if you've just searched, you know, you can just, my recommendation is don't uh, pay for anything, but there, because there are tons of free stuff available, you know, that you can pretty much investigate and to see that, you know, where you can find the niche that you're looking for, you know. Yes, sir. Uh, sure. Uh, the thing is, um, sure, he's, he's addressing the cost, you know, for developing the blockchain and so on. So that's why I want to really repeat this. Uh, when we talk about blockchain, please don't look at it as one category of products. There are a lot of different types of blockchains, you know. You have to look at your own application and see among these categories of blockchains, which one can be customized to meet your particular needs, you know. So that's, that's the key area. That's what a lot of people don't talk about. A lot of people just automatically look at the negative uh, technology aspects of Bitcoin and they say, well, you know, we cannot have a thousand servers running consuming this much power and affecting the environment and this and that. Whereas a private blockchain that is among, you know, say three or four companies, you know, and is doing a great, you know, operation for that particular task has not, has, is not doing anything like, you know, what, what we said, what Bitcoin and, you know, systems are doing, Bitcoin-based systems are doing and so on. So it's, it, that level of customization can really determine the cost, you know, and what you want. Yes, sir. Uh, private blockchain, permission bliss, permission, which one? So again, uh, we have to, there is not one blockchain. In a public blockchain, for your information, uh, the data is um, open to everybody. But not the sender and the receiver and so on. If 
Farhad gives John 15 bucks. Farhad's name is, you know, is, uh, is not there. You see a bunch of digits or numbers and so on. You know? And John's name the same way. But what has happened between us, it's actually, you can see us. Today, you can go to Bitcoin uh, blockchain and look exactly who is doing what, who is buying, you know, who is selling, not the, the names, but you know all the activities that are going on. But when you look at the private blockchain, uh, it only those people who are involved with it. You know. Now, if you, if you have a, a federated one and a group of companies that are working, only the people in those companies would have access based on the rules that they put. They, might, they may not give access to every participant, you know, every employee, every, and only certain individuals will be, will be able to see things and so on. So all of those are you know, managed by the people who are running that particular you know, private blockchain. You know, yes, ma'am. That's an excellent question. Uh, uh, sure. Oh, sure. Uh, so she's asking, what's going to happen if you have a bad actor that actually you know, brings in false information, and then there's a consensus? So I'm oversimplifying the consensus you know, over here. There's actually a protocol over there that you know, you, it, uh, it has to happen as far as, first of all, when you bring something, Somebody has to validate that data itself. So one of those miners, or somebody, somebody has to check the validity of that, you know. And then before adding it to the blockchain, that has to be validated before gets ad before being added to the block. So there's an entire process, you know, that has to happen. And uh, you know, seriously, in the next session, I will try to explain that because. Uh, that, that is a great question, you know, and, and, but there are, there are provisions for that to, eliminate, to prevent that. Well, I, I'm not really, once again, talking about Bitcoin, but let's sure. say you're talking about um, chickens that are being, you know, they're being fed and they're being fed and they're being fed and they're being fed and they're Sure. So let's look at it today. What happens today? Today, for example, um, you know, if I'm buying fish from this, you know, fisherman in, say, Japan, you, you know, from Korea, it doesn't matter. Part of that process is actually our people go over there to pretty much check their system. There's a quality assurance process and so on. You, you check that. And, but the beauty of it, and then sometimes you have to give them certain rules and regulations and say, you have to follow these rules. When you catch a fish, you have to do the following things and so on before you ship them to me, etc. So you make sure that they put those things in place. What blockchain uh, provides you in that case, everything that you agreed, Everything that you decided, you know, it gets documented. And uh, so that, that record is not changeable. That record is fixed, okay? So blockchain is not there to come and say, do you really have the $5 in your pocket or not? No, you know, but if you give $5 to someone, that gets recorded and we maintain that data and nobody will, you know, be able to change that um, uh, information. So, exactly. The ledger keeps all the receipts, all the documents, anything that is important to you as a consumer, as a buyer, as you know, somebody who is involved in import, export, and so on, any way that you qualify this, your supplier, basically, all that information and the agreement that you have all gets copied here. By the way, part of the blockchain, the, you know, part of the Ethereum broad is they call it a smart contract. And these are the basically uh, contracts that they are programs that are written that they, they get executed. Meaning, I buy something from you and you usually send it to this person to ship it to me, okay? But this person, 
you do a great job sending it to that individual, but this, this person always takes two or three weeks before shipping, the, uh, shipping that product to me. So I can actually have a, part, a blockchain contract over here and say, I only pay you once I get the product, okay? So this contract is part of this blockchain. So when you send the product over there, there is a record of that. When that product comes to me, there's also a record of that, and that blockchain contract built into the blockchain checks that to see, okay, now I actually got the product because I can scan the barcode on the box and enter that into the blockchain. Now that contract gets executed. Now you receive the money, and so on. So uh, there's tons of, tons of customization that based on applications that we, we do, basically, you know, depending on what we want. This gentleman had his hand. Yes, sir. Yeah, sorry, um, I just was wondering if you were aware of um, Balaji uh, Srinivasan. He's a former CTO of Coinbase, right? He okay. He wrote a book called The Rise of the Crypto Nation State, and you were talking about earlier. So, and just this, this topic, right? Um, another person says that Ethereum could become a digital country that's adjacent to the U.S. and China. I just wonder if your thoughts are on that. There are a lot of a lot of statements and there are a lot of speculations like that, you know. And of course, neither U.S. or China is going to allow that to happen. Remember one thing: when uh, when Facebook this came out with their own money, okay, and they said we're going to have our own cryptocurrency. And by the way, we are three billion people users, and these users are all over the place. And pretty soon, we're going to bypass the U.S. dollar and we're going to start doing things and so on. Somebody has slapped their hand and said, "No, we shut it down," and they laid off all those people. You know, so what I'm saying is, once it gets too serious, you know, uh, if somebody, you know, wants to go and basically do things that is totally unacceptable, you know, there, there are governing, you know, infrastructure that prevents that, you know. Sir, yes. we have time for one with this one last question. Go ahead. Excellent, excellent question. Taxation again. That can built into the blockchain itself. The same because now you have a perfect records that are not changeable. You know, and, and so these records can be either sent to your CPA, to the CPA of the organization, and so on. And based on that, income statements are formed, how much you made, how much your expenses were, and so on. So what your profit is, so um, you know, what your taxes are based on that, and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's kind of automatic built into this. Now you can, again, part of this development, customization, you can pay your taxes as you go, de depending on what US government um, allows you to do, and so on, or you can um, you know, pay at the end of a year, etc. depending on the level of money we're talking about, you know, yeah. Thank you so much, Farhad, for no sharing your knowledge and expertise. Thanks. We appreciate it. No Thank you all for being here. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Teddy, for all your help.